Hi, I'm Dave Randall of the Whale Center, and I'm here with my good friend Phil Lane, Jr. Phil is an hereditary chief, a member of the Ankin Sioux Tribe in the White Swan Band, and we first met when a group of elders gathered in Aska for the Choices of the Futures Conference and the Earth Ambassador Training, where Phil received the hereditary headdress and the Windstar Choices Award, an international award where other recipients have been people like Jacques Cousteau, Lester Brown, Wangari Matai, Jimmy Carter. So he's in pretty good company with that award, and he's a member of the Whale Center Board of Directors, and we're so pleased to have you here in uh, Florida, Phil. Well, it's really, it's really been wonderful to come down where the beautiful rain has increased in British Columbia, and to come down this beautiful not just beautiful weather, but all the wonderful relatives and, and uh, good friends that I've been able to be with as yourself and to enjoy this uh, great visit we've had. Okay, thank you. This past weekend, uh, we were involved in the Sacred Lands um, seminar that you facilitated on healing ourselves, our community, and Mother Earth, sponsored also by the Global Healing Initiative, whose idea is there can be no peace without justice and no justice without sustainability. Would you share with our audience here sure. some of your, your reflections on that and, and uh, some of the indigenous insights, particularly in wisdom towards sustainability? Well, I believe we're at a time in history where the most important process or understanding that we need to come to is the understanding of the oneness of the human family. The prior unity and oneness of the human family. In fact, we've always been one human family that, whether it be scientifically from a biological, anthropological uh, perspective, or from a spiritual perspective, we are one human family. And I think that with that understanding of one human family, then justice begins to be very clearly understood to be a key foundation for developing a peaceful world. Because if the hurt of one is the hurt of all, and the honor of one is the honor of all, and we are one human family, all of us, then things like extremes of wealth and poverty, uh, no clean water for some and clean water for others. These kinds of prejudices that lead to these kinds of circumstances all have to be eliminated. So with the, with the oneness of humanity, with that consciousness, in fact, every prejudice of every form of this sort has to be eliminated. And in, in, in when we realize that every child is like our child, Every grandchild is like our grandchild. Every elder, as we're going to be, <laughs> it was not long ago here, we, we weren't, uh, got here so quick, but every elder that needs to, care, to be cared for is our elder to care for. Then I think we'll be able to come to a, to a beginning process of peace. And I've been sharing with various relatives regarding uh, the issue of treaty rights. And, and, and you know, injustices have been, been done over, you know, thousands of years to many different members of the human family. And, you know, I thought to myself, you know, if we could just for a moment, without the extinguishing these, these, these um, uh, issues, put them aside for a minute, and then let's begin by just saying every single human being needs to have fresh clean water. Every single human being needs to have the opportunity to have a good education. Every human being needs a place they can live in a shelter and food to eat and health care. Let's, let's, let's get that taken care of. Okay, we get that all taken care of for everybody. Uh, and that doesn't mean everybody the same. Because we have to have, it's, it's, a, it's a unity and diversity. But it means, obviously, the extremes of wealth and poverty have to be balanced. Yeah, you seem to be saying uh, that we need to really pay more attention to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and if everybody could 
have those human rights, uh, education and health care and clean water and so forth. Well, let's, as a beginning, okay? yeah. Let, let's take care of that. That, that, that that's, that's justice for everyone. Okay? Right. Then, then let's take a look then at these treaties. Let's take a look at other agreements that were made and then be able to address them in that light. I mean, right now, nobody's getting any of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and those that are in poverty are getting more in poverty. And those that have wealth are just getting more wealth. Uh, those without clean water are not getting clean water. More are getting unclean water. Right, right. You know, so I'm not saying that these kinds of issues like treaty rights should be just forgotten. But let's, this is, this is a beginning point, let's agree that every single human being, uh, if we are one human family, if, 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 you, if we were understanding as one human family and you had three or four children, you wouldn't uh, give one clean water and the other two unclean water. It'd all be given clean water. If you had three children uh, uh, and you had resources for them to get an education, you would share that to the best you could so they could get the best education you could provide. Well, I think that when we uh, understand that truly uh, humanity is our family, and as well, I think uh, we were talking about this and joking about this earlier. Um, as my father said, and so often when I was younger and I didn't understand, he says, we're only here for a short time, son. We're only here for a short time. Well, it's true. It's getting true every day. And we were speaking uh, with our brother here, and he was saying uh, his wife's uh, mother is 98. And she says, even goes faster. I can't imagine that. You know, so we're really only here for a short time. We're not going to take any of this, from my understanding, with us. I mean, when some of these most wealthy people we've known in our lives, uh, the richest people in the world, when they passed on, I think probably the classic of our day was Howard Hughes. You know, there was about six or seven lawyers around his, his grave, and they didn't come with dump trucks and dump. Uh, dumped money in the grave. So I, I, anyway, that's that's my hope. The, is that understanding that it's it's from this consciousness of the oneness of humanity. When we have that, then we begin to really understand and can apply justice. I'm struck yesterday when you were talking about your own spiritual background and your own tradition, and how there really was a oneness with other traditions, too. Could you share a little bit about some of your sure. experiences with uh, Well, with that? Um, I was sharing yesterday that, that um, uh, I've had a good fortune over the years to visit many different sacred places that people hold sacred traditions. And it was amazing to me to go, for instance, to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. And I prayed there stood there and prayed where so many people had put their prayers. You know, and I felt the spirit, the creator there. And you say, well, I'm talking about the great spirit. And then I walked along the Via de la Rosa, the trail of tears, or uh, path of tears, uh, the way of tears, where Jesus really marked where he fell with the cross. And I felt the spiritual, same spiritual uh, feeling, same spiritual Oneness, and I went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and I felt it there. I went to the Temple Mount, uh, where all the Muslim relatives prayed, and I felt the same, same spirit of oneness, same spirit of the Creator. And I've had the opportunity to go to India to visit various uh, holy places there of various saints and, and teachers of India, and I felt the same feeling there. Um, had the opportunity to, to um, go to various Sikh communities and felt the same spirit there. Um, when I was in Israel as well, I went to Mount Carmel where all the Baha'i holy places are and I felt the spirit there. And then I've had the opportunity to go to Bear Butte and other places uh, down uh, in, in, uh, in Dine Pueblo lands, sacred places there, and felt that same 
spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, through Southeast Asia, to various Buddhist holy places, and felt the spirit there. Uh, and been with relatives who had uh, sacred uh, items from Africa, and you feel those, and, and you hear their prayers, you feel that oneness. So I don't know of any place that I've you know, really gone that, that if we, we come with respect and we come with love and whatever that spiritual tradition is, that, uh, that I haven't felt that spirit. And so I think it's, it's, it's this recognition uh, that there's one creator, one, this, one creator, there's one humanity. And really, from my perspective, I find that really at the core and the spiritual foundation of all religions are about kindness, love, compassion, forgiveness, justice, and humility, having faith. But all, all these spiritual foundations are all the same. Now they differ certainly in their social teachings. And I think that if we look uh, over time, you know, from my perspective, this is my perspective, because uh, when I was growing up, I was wondering, well, why would a loving creator who created a universe so huge only bring his truth to one people at one time in history? And as I was growing up, I heard the stories of our white buffalo calf woman and the holiness that she brought that continues her teachings, the seven sacred rites of the white buffalo calf woman. Uh, I heard of the teachings of Quetzalcoatl, uh, Viracocha, uh, Shalom Bala in, in the Americas, other places in the Americas, and so many other teachers. So I, I really believe that, uh, that, that, that all human beings uh, in our growth and development, there's been progressive revelation, there's been continually spiritual teachers coming to, 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 to teach us. And there's been those universal teachers that have brought entire civilization brought new laws, new calendars. <laughs> and so, uh, if, you know, with this understanding that there's one humanity and one creator, uh, and then we can find this oneness to come together spiritually in a spiritual way. Now, you're enjoying wearing, wearing uh, uh, your hat. And some people traditionally uh, wear various uh, headdresses of various forms, whether it be a hat or a headdress or whatever. And each one of those signify something to that person. Or uh, you're wearing a shirt that you enjoy. When you got on, you put your shirt on. And I, I enjoy this sh shirt. Or some people enjoy certain shoes or enjoy certain things to eat. Uh, but the main thing is, unless there's something uh, of mental illness, each of us value our lives as much as the other person values their life. And all you have to do to go to any culture to find that out is try to harm somebody's children. You'll find out. <laughs> and I don't care how much the money they have or don't have. When it comes to our lives, we each value our life as much as the other Great. Right. When we first uh, met, you were involved in this project the sacred tree. I've noticed it's progressed, and we now have a, a new introduction in this new edition with uh, Dr. Jane Goodall. Yes. But this really came about by bringing different tribal elders from some 45 tribes together to uh, create this, this story. Say, say a little well, bit about well, that. Well, um, the sacred tree is really a uh, is co-authored. Uh, and really drawn from uh, many, 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 many uh, elder stories and values and so forth. And what the, the focus of the sacred tree is, is not to get into, uh, you do a ceremony this way or that way, but to get down again to these values that are life-preserving, life amazing, that are found at the heart of indigenous cultures everywhere. This is one way it's been shared and, and uh, presented. There's many ways to find these cultural universals. Uh, and so, uh, the, 
the reason why the name the sacred tree or the tree of life uh, was chosen and that archetype was chosen is because you find it in civilizations everywhere in the world everywhere right and, and I know when we started we found this in the Christian Judeo-Christian tradition the story of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden it was being concealed by the tree of knowledge that Adam and Eve were told not to eat from and out of that tree of life were the four rivers that flow to the four worlds same as the indigenous mm -hmm. tradition and the fruits of the tree of life were the same as the fruits of the spirit and so forth and the totems were the same eagles and and lions and bears uh, they had ox rather than buffalo but pretty <laughs> similar you know and uh, the ox of course you know is a cosmic symbol in the same way the buffalo is here and for native people and we're finding this is true with other trees around the world Absolutely. too. You know, it's, 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 it's so interesting that, that um, in the story of uh, the Garden of Eden, and you ask most people, well, how many trees were in the Garden of Eden? And usually people say, well, there was a tree that, that uh, uh, they ate a forbidden fruit. Right. And that was a tree of knowledge. But the tree of life was there as well. Right. And the tree of life did not get cut down. Right. And those four rivers that come from the Garden of Eden make the perfect uh, four directions. I mean, some people call it a medicine wheel, some people call it the uh, circle of life, and it's, it's different from culture to culture, but what the other cultural universal is, along with the sacred tree or the tree of life, is a circle. And we still see in our, our modern culture today, the movie The Avatar is about uh, protecting the tree. The tree of, of life. life, exactly. In fact, it was really amazing when I went to, uh, to see Avatar. I went to see it four times. <laughs> That's how much I enjoyed it. And, one for each world. Uh, yeah, one for each world. <laughs> and uh, because it was, it was an exact mirror of the story of the sacred tree, which really is an archetype, this journey to the sacred tree, where we uh, are seeking out to find that which brings us peace and harmony and happiness and love, and then uh, the the that how you know we would wander away from the tree. If we lost that and tried to destroy it, you know, great harm would come to the people and so forth. Well, anyway, it's it's just a, a direct reflection of that beautiful story that was so beautifully done and and, and, and presented. I felt uh, by uh, James Cameron. I understand there's a second avatar coming. And a third, I think, also, in the I, works. <laughs> third. So anyway, I, I just, I thoroughly enjoy that. I'm, I'm curious to see how they're going to to continue on the journey. But there was a, uh, a group I worked with here two weeks ago from San Francisco, uh, the Papamala Alliance. And the Pachamama Alliance actually brought James Cameron down to Quito, Ecuador. They brought Avatar, and then they brought from the the uh, deep Amazon, people who had never really been out of there, to come and see it. And of course, their experience was, you know, this is what's happening to us. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a it's a a, a, a a archetype that I think that we can even feel even in going up and, and visiting with our Inuit relatives up uh, on the Arctic Circle, they still have this concept of the family tree, of this, this relationship, uh, and found a, a connection that way. So it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a symbol that's, that is manifested in various ways in various cultural traditions and these various things. Okay. What else would you like to share before we conclude here with our audience? Well, um, <coughs> I me talk to Yepi. I'm gonna just share her. But, um, you know, from my perspective, anything that's spiritual has infinite meaning, and I think that this fighting that's going on over religion—it's such a heartbreaking situation. I mean, to think we have these infinite treasuries of spiritual wisdom, and the fact that they're spiritual means they, they're eternal. I mean, all the various sacred teachings I've had a chance to hear or to read. Some are oral, some you find written in various holy books. 
And all of them, if they're spiritual, have infinite meaning. They have infinite meaning. That's because they're spiritual. If they don't have infinite meaning, then they're not eternal. Right. They're not eternal, they're not spiritual, so to speak. And, and to see how uh, people can take something that could have meaning, a different meaning every day of your life, or something you pick up and read uh, that you've read 10 years ago and read it today, and all of a sudden, spiritually, aha, uh -huh, there's something else here. And to fight over this, it just seems this is really sad. One of my spiritual teachers uh, said that if you don't like uh, uh, the way you read a sacred literature, the Bible or whatever, wait 10 years, it'll all be different. And that's really so true because our, our lives change and we do see the world differently and then we interpret differently too. Well, you know, I, I uh, yesterday, <clears throat> yesterday I was reflecting and sharing about my grandfather, Brian Deloria Sr. And a story he told me, um, Oh, late 60s, when this whole environmental uh, uh, issue, ecology, came up. Yeah, can you share that story with our group sure. here? Sure. Well, in the late 60s, 1960s, I had a chance to spend some time at the home of my grandfather, Vine Deloria Sr., who was an incredible storyteller and really kept many of the stories of our family on my father's side. And of course, he and my father would have these long visits, and my father would sit with, with his father. Kipisapa, Philip Gloria Black Lodge, and they'd have an Indian visit uh, where Joshua Lodog, who fought against General Custer, would come, and they called an Indian visit where you come in October and stay till April. <laughs> That's an Indian visit. And anyway, uh, so we had a good visit, and I remember him telling me this story that really has touched touched me. And in fact, uh, uh, we did a film called Walking with Grandfather that came out of this story. Uh, that occurred. And um, he said that, that back in the late 60s, this whole environmental ecology thing began to emerge and people began using it you know, on the radio and, and talk about it. And he said there was an old gentleman that uh, was an older cousin of his, uh, um, I believe his name was Good Elk, who um, Again, hearing this word in English, he couldn't speak English very well, but he loved to le learn new English words. He loved to learn words. So he said, say Tahashi, he said, say cousin, he said, what is this? He was talking to him in Dakota, I said, what is this uh, new word I hear? Ecology, what does that mean, ecology? And so, of course, he tried the best he could uh, to describe to him what this was all about. He said, well, you know, he said, you know, Tahashi said they have these places where now people go to school, as you know, they learn to, to read these things and then they learn to write about what they read about and they, and they talk about what they write about and they read some more and write some more and talk about some more. And finally, after sometimes 18 or 20 years, they finally finish going to this education and learning about life. They even get a piece of paper that says they're a doctor of life. They, they, they are, they're a master. They know everything about life. And so then they take the best readers and writers and those that can speak about it very well and understand it and study it uh, and, and can go and utilize these different uh, tools in a, in a laboratory. You can try to kind of describe some of these tools. You know, things you look out in the heavens and things that are far away makes them look close and you look inside these things and things that are small, this machine makes them look big. And they've taken poor Mother Earth back and forth in these little tubes and they do all these tests and so forth. They have to look at everything. They've been studying everything. They've spent lots and lots of money. He said, do you know what they found out? They found out everything's interrelated. They found out when you pollute and poison the water, which all living things drink for life. You pollute and poison the When you pollute and poison the air, it's all living things need to breathe for life. You do all the things. And so he turned to him and says, so what do you think about that? The old man kind of shook his head and kind of smiled and said, oh, huh? He said, 
I was wondering when they get around to that. I was wondering when they get around to that. But look what they do to our mother. They cut her hair where it shouldn't be cut. And they rip up her skin where it shouldn't be ripped up. And they take and drill holes inside of her and suck her blood out. And then they put things inside of her and blow her bones up. And they turn to my grandfather she was and said, and what would happen if you did that to your mother? She'd die. That's exactly, he said, what's going to happen if we don't begin respecting and honoring and restoring and protecting our sacred mother. And, and this respect you talk about is really rooted in this understanding that all things are connected. Yes. And, and I think, you know, the, the word ecology comes from two Greek words, oikos, logos. Wonderful. Oikos means home. Logos uh -huh. is the logic of or wisdom of. And indigenous people seem to really understand the earth is our only home. Yes, beautiful. Where others haven't maybe beautiful. got that awareness. And, and that seems to be maybe one of the key uh, principles of this ethic you speak of, of the fourth way. Yes. Well, you know, and, I, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that. I didn't know and understand that meaning. And I, I love words, too. <laughs> Whatever words I can learn, yeah. you know, they, they all have such deep meaning. If we, you know, though, I mean, not, you know, let's have a cup of coffee. That can have a lot of meanings, too. You know, that's a time to visit and stuff. But, right. but this word, because this is our home. It is our, our, our it's our transitory home, so to speak. But it is also the home of our future seven generations, the home of those that have gone before us. Right. And I believe that it's that love as well for ourselves as we have for this gift we have from the Creator. Because we are each, from my perspective, a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. Each of us is a spiritual representative of all that have gone before us. Therefore, we have within us, even genetically, everything that's come before us, but also spiritually, all those beloved ones are with us, from, from my perspective. And, you know, I'm, I believe this perspective is shared not just by quote unquote indigenous people, but by many human beings all over Mother Earth. In fact, we're really all indigenous people. We all at one time sat before the sacred fire. Our relatives did. Some, some were back in there. And some better back in there, you know, we did come from one clot of blood. Way, 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 way deep. And I believe from the beginning, we've always been in potentia human beings, spiritual beings, who have on, been on the spiritual journey. And we're coming to a time now, we know, where we're really beginning to either face the reality that we can no longer live as we're living on this Mother Earth without destroying everything that human life needs to live on, or to change ourselves from within and completely have to change our lifestyle. This is not just about, you know, uh, getting a new, uh, uh, you know, better car that right. uses less, alf I mean, uses less uh, uh, fuel. It's not just about that. This is about making complete lifestyle change. Well, Phil, thank you so much for spending time and sharing from your wisdom and tradition. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. We're just a mirror <laughs> to each other.